This is Joshua Block. If you don't already know him, you'd be forgiven for thinking he just escaped from a mental asylum. However, he's actually a very popular content creator, with his World of T-Shirts TikTok account boasting 2.6 million followers. A man of many talents, he solidified his standing in the public consciousness through hard work and shrewd hustling. At least, that's probably what he believes. The truth is that Joshua may be the only person who takes himself even slightly seriously. Ever since his unorthodox jump to stardom, he's worked overtime to erode every bit of goodwill his initial fans may have had for him, be it due to his violent outburst against a fish, the fact that many people take issue with him charging fans for photos, or having a smidge too much love for the bottle. This has resulted in him securing an audience hell-bent on seeing him completely self-destruct. But how did it come to this? What's the story behind the downfall of TikTok's newest lol cow? If you're one to believe websites like Wikitubia and Know Your Meme, you'll find that Joshua had uploaded his first ever video on September 22nd, 2020. And in fact, you'll see this repeated in multiple other places. But the story of Joshua and his channel go back further than that, all the way back to June of 2019, when the then 17-year-old first started uploading videos. For a while, he would continue uploading them to minimal views, doing so simply for fun, until he finally got his big break in October of that year, which was a video of him eating crickets. Yo, exotic food check. It was with this initial success that the starstruck Joshua began to take TikTok much more seriously. You see, ever since he was rather young, Josh had always dreamed of being self-employed, and he realized that TikTok was his golden ticket to boss mode. He would go on to do everything in his power to capitalize on this in the short term, to very mixed success, with a lot of his videos from then to September 2020 getting four-digit views. But despite the low amount of attention, the few popular uploads he did have would be enough for him to slowly build a niche community, drawn to the channel by his bizarre behavior. The best example of this is definitely his lip sync videos, which were some of his most popular content at the time. Take this one, in which he mouths the lyrics of My Heart Will Go On by Celine Dion. Except, mouthing may not be the right term here, as a more apt description might be that he's flapping his jaw like an upside down trash can in rhythm to the song's lyrics. Or take this example, where he laments the terribleness of the year 2020 by lip syncing Happy New Year by Studio 99. Both of these demonstrate a rather peculiar quality of Josh, one that could be argued to have been the initial thing that drew people in. His distinct lack of facial experience expressions. In the second video, despite talking about the death of someone important enough to him to make a whole TikTok out of it, he remains completely deadpan, with his eyes barely even moving throughout. It didn't take a genius to understand that there was something special about Josh, from his odd mannerisms to his very stilted delivery. This resulted in most of the growing fan base being composed of people who just made fun of him, seeing him in the same light as any other TikTok lol cow. But that was all Josh needed, and as his notoriety slowly increased, his videos would start getting a fair bit more views, with numerous uploads getting in excess of 100 K hits, and some of them even got 200k. Staying true to his form, these were extremely varied, everything from videos about the pandemic, to random goofs, to even more lip syncs. Of course, while it's easy for us to see that his main draw was the fact he was basically a laughing stock, it doesn't really seem Josh had caught on to that fact, because as he became more and more popular, he began looking for other avenues of potential growth. This would lead to him creating a YouTube channel by the name of World of Interviews on April 8th, 2020. Nothing's really known about this channel, as the only things you'll find on it are two videos with our titular hero. One of them is a short where he introduces us to what the channel is all about. Welcome to World of Interviews, a YouTube channel where we do podcast interviews with famous TikTokers. Discover your favorite celebrities today. The second video is a five-minute interview with the man himself, conducted by some random person who I, I haven't actually found anything about at all. The video reveals some interesting facts. For one, Josh shares with us that he had first downloaded the TikTok app in 2019 and that he had started uploading on it around August. He mentions how by September he fell in love with TikTok, and by October he became TikTok famous in his own words. He also went on to share with us that he had 240,000 followers at this point in time. He then says he's in the top 10,000 on famous birthdays, which as far as I can tell, is correct. When asked what exactly he owes this success to, he credits the facts that his uploads tend to be varied, as opposed to, you know, the actual reason people were watching him, which seems to be completely over his head. I do variety videos. 
most people on the app only post stick to one thing. Throughout the interview, he presents this YouTube channel as a guaranteed cash cow, planning to use his TikTok success and the success of other large TikTok creators he would interview to launch his YouTube channel into orbit. There wasn't much more to the interview besides the fact he once again mentions how he's still in high school at this point. For context, he was born August 7th, 2001, which would have made him 18 years old. We'll get deeper into the implications of this a bit later, but keep that tucked in your noggin. This concludes with a few more TikToks made by Joshua, which are about the same quality as you would expect with his signature still to delivery. Overall, the whole video was pretty boring, which is enough of an explanation for why it never really took off. Besides being confused on whether the interview was shot by Joshua or the interviewer, most people were far more interested in the mysterious figure standing in Joshua's doorway in the first half of the video. Questions about it were completely unanswered for the time being. Regardless, the channel was very quickly abandoned for reasons that should be obvious enough to anyone, but that didn't mean he was done experimenting with content. In September of 2020, he would once again attempt to diversify his audience by creating a secondary TikTok account called the Starbucks Club, which in his own words was a channel meant purely for people who drank Starbucks, as explained thoroughly across the first three videos on his channel. While the channel definitely had more of that unique Joshua flair than the YouTube, it seems he would abandon it pretty quickly after not finding success. Joshua is extremely familiar with the sunk cost fallacy, but there was some good news. While the side projects were a miserable failure, the World of T-Shirts channel was doing pretty well, so Josh continued to upload on it consistently. But at this point, he was still quite unknown, with his fan base being very insulated. All of this would change on the hallowed day of September 22nd, with the upload of a quaint little video in which he mouths the lyrics to some parody song, staying true to form by looking like the main character of Ride to Hell Retribution. Now, this video is actually not that remarkable in terms of views, as at this point, he would be getting 200,000 views pretty regularly. But it does serve as a split-off point between obscurity and a sudden rise to fame. Because you see, at this point, the sky was the limit for our friend with the steely gaze, and he started uploading hundreds upon hundreds of videos to his TikTok channel every single month, with a number of them scoring very solid views, including this oddball duet where he humorously judges an obvious joke TikTok. But the real difference came as September ended, when he finally broke the 200,000 view roof he had been confined to for so long with an upload on the 2nd of October. This video was dedicated to enlightening his viewers about the facts that pandemics happen roughly every 100 years, listing a couple of plagues going about 300 years back, and managing to actually get 2 million views for this informative piece. Just a few days later, however, he would go on to beat this record with a video where he painted his tongue two different colors with the use of some gummies, helpfully explaining to us the entire process. So these will change the color of your tongue permanently for weeks. We're gonna put these in my mouth and wait 10 minutes. It's not coming off. Shit. This video shattered his previous record from just a few days prior with 10 million views. His before insulated audience had now expanded, as millions of unaware and very confused normies were exposed to the world of t-shirts, expressing a mix of sheer befuddlement and amusement in the comments. With videos like these and many, many more, his whole channel exploded, getting four times the followers in October compared to what he got in September. He had become a veritable normie magnet, as his content became ever-present on TikTok front pages. However, while all this success was certainly nothing to scoff at, this was merely a precursor for what was to come, as our eternally ambitious main hero would not be satisfied with just filming himself at home being utterly asinine. So at the tail end of 2020, he would dedicate his time into a slightly different kind of content, music. Josh announced his first song in November of 2020, set to be released on the 1st of December. He announced it in much the same way you would probably expect from him at this point, sounding perhaps even more deadpan than he usually does, which is pretty impressive. I'm releasing a song on December 1st. It's very short, it's only about a minute long, but it's all about COVID. Since I have UM Select, it'll go to TikTok, Instagram, Spotify, and a whole lot of other platforms. Be ready. It'll be coming. Indeed, Josh would grace us with the release of his song on Spotify, and frankly, it's a beauty. During the 47 second runtime, he reminds us of just how good he had it in 2019, and how as soon as we entered 2020, our whole world came crashing down. I remember 2019, living our best lives. New Year's Eve came along, looking forward to 2020. It marked the new decade. Everything was fine till March. Toilet paper shortage, quarantine, masks, social distancing. No job, no school, no nothing. Lockdown, everything canceled. Oh no. 
This artful piece would end up netting him around 65,000 listeners on Spotify. With that initial success, Josh saw there was a potential for his music. So only a month later, he announced a new song on the 31st of December while he danced joyfully to a small excerpt. As for the song itself, it would also be released on Spotify. And if you thought the last one was life-changing, then you're not prepared for what I'm about to show you. It was a love ballad dedicated to, as the name suggests, coffee and boba tea. Wake up in the morning, throw some clothes on, check my phone, run out the door, where do I go? Of course, to get some coffee and some boba tea. The song would end up doing better numbers on Spotify, getting around 130,000 hits. Seeing the monumental success, Josh felt inclined to truly capitalize. He created his own website, registering it under the domain worldoftshirts.com on the 1st of February, later being changed to worldoftshirts.ai. The website serves a few purposes, advertising his music and selling his merch, which contains various memes and in-jokes from his community. But it's at this point that Joshua shifts his TikTok content pretty much entirely. And on the 14th of March, 2021, already a few months after his initial blow up, he uploaded a video of himself standing in Times Square, loudly singing Empire State of Mind by Jay-Z, specifically the part sung by Alicia Keys, all while surrounded by a crowd of bemused onlookers. In New York, concrete jungle where dreams are made of, there's nothing you can't do, now you're in New York. This got him over 30 million views, setting the stage for exactly the kind of content we would expect. He was no longer creating content from the confines of his home. Instead, he was making the exact same thing, but out on the streets of New York, which made it even funnier because you got to see bystanders in the background look at him like, what the f*** are you doing? It's with this shift in location that our protagonist would reach the peak of popularity, gaining 640,000 followers in March alone. His videos were getting millions of views, and his streams were attended by tens of thousands of people. Well, it's hard to say if he made any money, it probably wasn't nothing. It shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that this new style of content wouldn't just attract a lot of attention from online fans, but also people in real life who would regularly go on to meet him in public while he was filming. With such a recognizable appearance and cadence, he's pretty hard to miss. Now, to most regular people, I'm sure the idea of constantly being harassed by fans doesn't sound that appealing, but for Josh, this was a catastrophe, one he wouldn't respond to in the healthiest manner. He would begin charging his fans $50 for the privilege of taking a photo with him, with multiple videos being released of him basically demanding money from fans. Of these, Perhaps the most popular is a video of him in Central Park, where a fan pays him to sing a song, with Josh looking even more dead-eyed than usual. Yeah, yeah, New York, concrete jungle where dreams are made of, there's nothing you can't do, now you're in New York. The response to this was very mixed. While the YouTube video that first shared this moment largely sided with Josh, there were other people in his own community who were baffled. This would culminate in his fans asking him why he charges people on a TikTok live stream. There, he would give a rather interesting response. I charge my fans for photos because if I just take their picture, they're gonna get famous quickly for nothing. Of course, it's his prerogative to charge or not charge people for photos. I mean, if he tells them ahead of time, hey, you gotta pay me to take a picture, they don't wanna do it, it's whatever. I'm just curious what what this response even means. Like, if you want money, say because I want money. Instead, it's they'll get famous quickly for, for nothing. What does that mean? Despite this, he would actually catch some flack from his fans, as many of them view this habit of his as proof that he only sees his fans as a source of income. People especially took issue with this comment about how he doesn't just want people blowing up in popularity for free, which they saw as him pulling up the ladder. That said, plenty of people still defend this practice, saying that part of why he likely does that is to dissuade random people from constantly approaching him. And the charging simply means that the only people he may get approached by are actual fans, at least in theory. It is worth noting he would later drop these prices, only charging $10 for pictures and $20 for videos. Of course, this didn't actually stop people from taking pictures and videos of him in creep shot fashion. If anything, this only further emboldened them to sneakily try to video him and then upload those videos to their own TikToks, with some of these going downright viral. A TikTok user by the name of Fern would upload a video of Joshua walking down the street, making fun of his amusing stride. But none of this ever got in the way of his monumental rise in popularity. In fact, as time went on, it seems a lot of people did genuinely start to root for him beyond just treating him as a lol cow. Even if many of the fans were intent on making fun of him, no one really thought of him as like a negative guy or an evil person. He was just someone who was kind of silly and funny to watch. But his grandest moment was yet to come. It was a short while after the charging fans incident that he would orchestrate what many view as the high point of his entire career. On the 25th of May, 2021, just a few months after he had begun live streaming, he gathered his fans in Times Square for a unique event when one of the billboards began to show an advertisement for his channel while he called himself the king of the concrete jungle. 
For anybody who's curious, a spot in Times Square could run you as little as $5,000 per day to as much as $50,000 per day depending on the ad and the length. Around this time, he would also do a small collaboration with a sizable YouTube channel called Side Talk, which focuses on interviewing people they meet while walking the streets. During this video, Josh does another rendition of the song that propelled him to stardom, gives a spicy hot take about school lunches, and charges one of the people present $25 for a photo. Notably, the video also includes one of the first, if not the first, use of a meme that will become rather popular on his channel, wherein he tells viewers that he's wearing Louis Vuitton because he was banned from Gucci. Overall, this first interview ended up being pretty successful, netting them 600,000 views and a pretty positive reception from commenters, who took the time to poke a little fun and also said that him only charging $25 was a blessing. The interview was so successful that Side Talk made another one just a few weeks later, where Josh once again wowed the crowd with his on-screen presence, and when told that 6 9 claimed the title of King of New York, Josh bluntly asserts that he is in fact the true king. What do you want to say to 6 9 right now? He claims to be the king of New York. I'm the king of New York. 6 9 is not the king. I am. I'm out here with no security because security's for quitters. I'm money bag Josh. Just like last time this one blew up, albeit not as much. Following the success of these interviews, an unaffiliated song artist by the name of Felix Cartal would make the band from the Gucci store meme into a song, which, in fairness to the artist, is miles better than anything Josh has ever produced. Overall, despite this early hiccup with charging fans money, he used his time in the spotlight pretty well. And while many people did view him as more of a laughing stock than a genuine content creator, he had enough genuine viewers watching to get by. Around this time, he also began getting the attention of mainstream media, with online publications beginning to take notice. One of these would be posted on an internet news outlet called The Tab, in which the author would do a little deep dive on some of his history, including the controversy of demanding payments. They also brought up a very interesting claim, showing what the author believes to be an older TikTok account of Joshua's, and how around that time, it had been reactivated, posting a very, uh, questionable meme. Hello, base department. Gonna need you guys to come down here. Now, I should note that while it's interesting to ponder, it's very unlikely Josh would ever post something like this. For one, whenever he attempts to do humor, it's extremely different in comparison. And for two, there's a high likelihood he might not even be interested in that sort of stuff, at least if Reddit detectives are to be believed, referring to a screenshot of a dating app called Grinder on his home screen, as well as an interesting little clip where he suggests that he had been banned from the app. Regardless, while this article made some leaps of logic, it was arguably just one more notch in Joshua's belt, proving just how solidly he had made himself part of mainstream culture by then. Unfortunately, things went sour pretty quickly after. Around early June, sometime prior to the second Side Talk video, Josh got together with a random fan, and the two decided to do some fishing in the Hudson River. While things started off innocent enough, they quickly turned into something far more sinister, when upon successfully catching a bluegill and pulling it out of the water, Josh proceeded to throw it on the ground forcefully and stomp on it like the lead singer of Sabaton, all while bearing the happiest smile I think I've ever seen. Scene. The reason he gives in the video for being this brutal is he justifies it by saying a fish shouldn't spend time in such dirty water, ostensibly making this stomping action an act of mercy. After that, he continues to throw the fish on the ground repeatedly without saying a word, letting out a demented giggle. This understandably wouldn't go unnoticed, as the video quickly made waves around TikTok, with reuploads of it getting upwards of a million views. It would also be uploaded to r slash public freakout, where it got quite a bit more attention, with hundreds of comments asking how a person could do such a cruel thing. Largely, they pondered what kind of mental disorder he was suffering from that would convince him this was a good idea or, you know, make him enjoy this. While it's hard to track just how large the backlash against him was at the time, it was clearly bad enough to where Josh felt the need to respond to it, which he would do in a now-deleted TikTok. He defended himself by saying that the fish was already dead, which in his mind made it far less serious than it previously appeared. He also complained about how it had been filmed without his permission, as the fan had not actually paid him to record. Okay, so a lot of people are upset about a leaked video of me stomping on a fish. First of all, the fish was already dead. The person who recorded me recorded me without my permission. They didn't pay the cameo, so they weren't even supposed to record me, but they posted it to set me up so that they would have an excuse to try and cancel me. I did not kill anything the fish was already dead. Given the original had been deleted, we can probably assume it was not well received by the public. The re-upload I showed was released around the same time as this whole drama was occurring, and the comment section is pretty much all disapproval, going as far as to suggest his behavior was a clear example of animal abuse, which can be a telling sign of a potential serial killer. The other, more rational commenters focus on the fact that he doesn't seem to even understand why what he'd done was wrong in the first place. The whole drama would actually make its way onto YouTube, where the clip of him stomping out a fish made some waves. Well, not as 
as big as it was in other places, you had some relatively large YouTubers like Mitchell Reacts covering it. Right around the time this fish video was released, the explosive growth of Joshua's TikTok stopped altogether. Although whether this is because of the drama he was finding himself in, or simply because people had lost interest, can't be said for certain. What can be said for certain is that that same month, Josh went on to achieve something quite important in his personal life. He graduated from high school. Many viewers made note of the fact he was almost 20 at the time of graduation, which confirms he was held back at least a year. But despite the minor bit of good news, Josh wasn't quite done with June. While doing a TikTok live stream in a hotel room, he was doxxed live on air as he received a call on the room's landline saying exactly where he was located at the time. Understandably, this led to a bit of a freak out on his end as he spun about the room like a chicken with his head cut off. This whole situation escalated even further when at some point Josh was kicked out of the hotel entirely after the supposed doxxer had convinced the hotel staff that he'd made a bomb threat. The interaction he has with the fan who recorded the video ends up being pretty amusing, as even with a stressful situation, Josh is still committed to the hustle, accepting $50 for giving the fan a privilege to film. But that wasn't quite the end of it, as the whole fish stomping incident began to pop up again, but not in the way you might think. People began to mass flag the World of T-Shirts TikTok account, which led to a temp ban in late July. As a result, he brought the Starbucks Club channel back to life and uploaded a teary-eyed apology where he begged for his account to be unbanned, giving a more thorough explanation of the bluegill bonanza. Okay, I'm sorry about the fish. It was a wrong thing for me to do to stomp that fish. Please, just give me my account back. It was my livelihood and they just took it away. This clip actually can't be found on TikTok anymore, although we can't exactly be sure why that is. If I were a betting man, then I'd bet my money on it being pretty poorly received, given he sounds less apologetic and more whiny than anything. Meanwhile, on YouTube, this situation wasn't exactly covered extensively, but I did find one pretty interesting development. The most popular video available about the subject was made by a fairly large TikToker by the name of Curly Daddy 101 He would release a video discussing the topic on a small YouTube channel, which includes the now-deleted apology. In it, CD claims to be a friend of Joshua's, although he doesn't go into any real specifics regarding this. He tells us that he'd been talking to Josh about his fears of getting banned because of getting repeated violations for supposedly unknown reasons. CD even claims to have contacted TikTok regarding this to try and put Josh's mind at ease. Largely, the video's purpose is to publicly show support for Josh, as he argues the reason he was banned was entirely unjust, given the fish stomping incident was never uploaded on the World of T-Shirts account, meaning TikTok never should have taken any action against him. CD also gives an emphatic defense of Joshua's character, arguing he was clearly not all there, while gleefully stomping on the bluegill. He concludes with a lengthy diatribe, lamenting how TikTok had become a completely anti-free speech platform, where people are not allowed to express themselves in any way that's deemed even slightly offensive to the blue-haired mob. He also gives a dire warning to TikTok that if they don't loosen up on their policies, people will eventually abandon the platform. As much as I wish that was true, nobody actually cares about censorship. <laughs> Unfortunately, people are just going to keep using it. The video received a fairly warm reception, with most of the people in the comments coming out in support of it, as well as in support of Joshua himself. From this point on, the timeline gets a little bit confusing, not least of all because there doesn't seem to be much archived info on the subject. From what I could gather, Josh would get his account back sometime around August, at which point things went back to normal. The second channel would upload a random promo for his website, as well as a short update about how he would no longer accept any photo or video taking requests after 5 p.m. But as we get to the end of August, the fish drama flares up once again, as a TikTok of him walking gets a community guideline strike, which he attributes to a mass flagging attempt by his haters. The response was pretty mixed. While some people in the comments seemed to support him, a lot of others still held a big grudge against him for the bluegill thing, with some going as far as to encourage him being harassed as a way of justice. As he continued posting these pleas for help, it seems more and more people turned against him, as the comment section of the later videos are completely swamped with people who outright hate the guy. This video in particular has a few comments calling him out for only responding to some random dude who asked if he could still donate. After posting another TikTok where he advertised his merchandise, he would post a quasi-conclusion to the whole saga, albeit a very, very vague one. Displayed is a screenshot taken from some sort of legal chat room, where Josh is being advised on how he could potentially sue TikTok for discrimination on the basis of his condition. It's hard to say when exactly, but at some point after this video was released, the World of T-Shirts channel was actually reinstated. There's no way to tell if these two things are connected, but it's honestly more likely that after his appeal succeeded, there simply wasn't anyone else who cared enough to flag his content again, or the systems finally kicked in and realized that he wasn't really doing anything bad on TikTok. That, or maybe, if you want to be conspiratorial, his implied legal threat actually worked, but to be honest, I doubt that TikTok is afraid of Joshua Block. Either way, he went back to doing what he knew best, recording himself walking through New York while being obnoxious. Following his success in getting his main account back, Josh would partner up with a small YouTube channel called Apex Primary to create a documentary about him, in which we found out some very interesting information. This mini doc covers quite a breadth of topics, most of which I don't really care about, from discussing how autism can affect 
impact children's development and their ability to socialize, to interviews with Josh's teachers in high school who sang praises of the young man. There are a few interesting tidbits here though. Firstly, we get a full confirmation that Josh himself is on the spectrum and that he had gone through a restrictive curriculum throughout his early years. Not that we couldn't really tell he was on the spectrum, but now it's officially confirmed. We also learn the identity of the mysterious figure looming from the April interview. Apparently, it's actually Joshua's grandfather, who goes by the name of Vincent Lisa. Amid all of the bloviating comments about how successful Josh has been, we also find out that he's actually been an entrepreneur of sorts ever since the 10th grade, when he officially created two different online storefronts, including the world of t-shirts and all things luxury. These were both created via a website called CafePress.com, which is basically like a like a super simple e-shop that allows you to create your own storefronts to sell your merch. To answer the question I'm sure you all have, yes, uh, he named his TikTok account after a virtual storefront, which he actually confirms for us when he tells us he had reused the name for his TikTok account in order to further promote his t-shirt selling business. There aren't really any archives of these websites, so we can't be sure what these shops used to sell. What we can be sure of, though, is that nowadays they both seem like an extension of his own personalized merch store on the World of T-Shirts website, selling such worthwhile items as World of T-Shirts Portrait Design Baby Football Bodies and World of T-Shirts Portrait Design Women's Boy Briefs, as well as, and I kid you not, tens of thousands of other items. I don't even know where all these came from. When you actually scroll through these items, you'll realize most of them are pretty much the same, with the exact same designs being put on multiple different kinds of items, and the same kinds of items being sold with only mildly differing designs. It does make you wonder what the actual business model of these websites even is, given that 95% of these products probably haven't been sold even once. Interestingly, Joshua has deemed these two e-shops enough of a success that he lists them on his personal LinkedIn profile, where he names himself the CEO of the two respective stores since March 2017. Notably, he also mentions how he's been the CEO of something called Joshua's ATT Corp. This company is actually listed on the Real Yellow Pages website, where it's described as a tech support service. It also links to what seems to be the actual website of the company, which says pretty much the same thing. Now, Joshua has been listed as CEO of the company since early 2014, when he would have been only 12 years old. Given that you can't even get a work permit until you're 15, it should probably go without saying that the listing is not accurate, to put it mildly, and it's more likely the website was run by his family, possibly his grandfather. This also puts into question how much time he actually puts into managing these storefronts. Add that to the fact he spends most of his days wandering about New York, and it's more likely he only has his name attached to the shops for feel-good points, or perhaps advertising, but there's no way he's actually running them. As the documentary goes on, we also find out a little bit more about his personal life. Among other things, we find out his mother, who was a sole guardian growing up, passed away due to ovarian cancer in 2015, when Josh was either 13 or 14 years old. Josh's father had attempted to take care of him, but due to his inability to do so, his grandfather opted to get full legal custody. The video ends on a positive note, with a rather hopeful outlook on what the future has in store for Joshua. The documentarians seem to feel he was just a silly guy who wanted to enjoy life and have fun on TikTok. For the time being, Josh was doing very well. While he was nowhere near the peak he had once occupied, he was still doing fairly solid numbers, and while some people had been turned off by his fish stomping, the audience he had seemed to be unaware of this, or just didn't care. As 2021 lingered on, Josh got more attention from the mainstream media, with various online publications releasing articles about him. The attention was all pretty positive, focusing on the fact that he's found so much success online despite the fact that he's autistic. After that, there wasn't really much to report on for a while, because Josh was pretty drama-free throughout 2022, doing pretty much the same exact kind of content you would expect him to make, walking around New York, recording song covers or parodies or lip syncs, and just having a fun time. Unfortunately, things began to change drastically when Josh turned 21. While prior to this, he had never been known to abuse substances in any way, it's at this point that a new side of him began to emerge. Josh started to drink copious amounts of alcohol. It started off as a somewhat worrying aside to him as a person, but quickly turned into a centerfold of his entire brand. Eventually, people began tuning in for no other reason than to see the kind of shenanigans Josh would get up to while hammered. Conversely, this led to Josh creating even more content in order to sate his fans' newfound desire to see him drunk, as he began to release dozens of videos where he was drinking himself silly or already very drunk and acting crazy. He would do the same on streams, where we got to see more of his raw, unfiltered self. This is all despite the fact that, at least in the beginning, he clearly wasn't very good at handling alcohol, probably because he never even had a sip of it prior to turning 21. What the hell was happening to me? I think I'm gonna be sick. <laughs> Oh! This stream archive in particular is quite noteworthy. Besides displaying just how inexperienced Joshua was at this point with drinking, it includes at least one interesting tidbit. <laughs> I'm sorry for everything bad I did. I'm sorry. Please, if I die, don't send me to hell. <laughs> I'm so sorry. 
I'm so sorry for stomping on that fish. I'm so sorry. I promise I'll never do anything like that. This may actually be the first time he'd ever given a genuine apology for the whole fish incident. While he's obviously inebriated, it does make one wonder how he actually feels about it, or if he actually does understand how what he had done was wrong. Or perhaps it's just a drunk person, drunkenly rambling. This new habit of his would only become more uncontrollable as time went on, with every subsequent stream becoming more and more unhinged. One good example is present in this clip, where he's being aggressively encouraged to consume more drinks while in a club bathroom as he pees on stream without even a hint of shame. However, things did not truly hit a fever pitch until Josh made a brand new friend, Michael Quinn. To give you a little introduction to Michael Quinn, he's a man somewhere between 40 to 60 years old, whose greatest genuine claim to fame is inheriting a company by the name of Feltman's Hot Dogs, which as the name suggests is famous for selling hot dogs. In fact, the company was so famous that it would eventually land him a TV interview on NBC. He's also a bit of a TikToker in his own right, although to call him that in earnest would be to give TikTokers a bad name, if you think that's somehow possible, with a grand total of 720 followers and a few more across his other social media accounts. He truly was a nobody prior to meeting Josh, at least in terms of having a following. But they met at some point in late 2022, at which point he and Michael would start to make content together. Some of the early videos seemed innocent enough, including featuring on a YouTube channel called Flavors of New York. However, things quickly devolved. And while there would be some scattered collabs like this, their focus quickly changed to where the real money was. At some point, Josh would hire Michael as his personal manager, wherein he would take a percentage of Josh's personal revenue in exchange for, as far as I can tell, pretty much doing nothing, other than following Josh around and encouraging him to drink more. Michael would quickly begin appearing in Josh's videos, perhaps being even more of a nuisance than Josh himself. He would regularly enable every bad behavior Josh engaged in, egging him on to get as many views as possible, no matter the cost to his well-being or dignity. It wasn't long before Michael was absolutely reviled in the world of t-shirts community. While people on TikTok would always welcome an opportunity to make Joshua do even more dumb things, the world of t-shirts subreddit was not nearly so polite towards him, and over the next few months, he would get absolutely railed by both Reddit and YouTube, with most of the criticism centering around the fact that he's basically just a clout leech, trying to siphon as much fame out of Josh as he possibly can. Naturally, Mike would go out of his way to defend himself from these haters, and he did so in the best way he knew how. Poorly. He would make a number of videos on his personal TikTok account, most of which are deleted today, where he would basically make the argument that he's actually helping Josh and others whom he works with. He would also regularly make the argument that he's actually trying to moderate just how much Josh drinks, with Josh himself drunkenly telling telling us that he only vomits when he's drinking alone. Of course, not a whole lot of people really took that defense very seriously. Pretty much the entire following that he would get from Josh were people who hated his guts, occupying the comment sections of his TikToks. But the hate campaign didn't stop there. Entire channels would pop up whose sole purpose was to document him and his behavior. In particular, a TikTok channel called Quinning2 would start re-uploading TikToks from Michael's personal account, as well as dozens of clips from the TikTok lives, capturing the craziest moments. This account would not be the only one to accuse Michael of being an out-and-out -out gooner. A post on the World of T-Shirts subreddit would make the same argument, highlighting an interaction from a live stream between Michael and Joshua, which sadly hadn't been archived. The post recounts how Michael was clearly trying to make Josh drink as much as possible by drinking alongside him, goading him into doing shots, in between telling Josh to defend him from the haters. The post also mentions how, for an upcoming trip to Paris, if it was okay for Michael to pay for everything and then give Joshua some extra allowance, which the commenter called sugar daddy behavior. The internet would throw a lot more accusations at Michael Quinn. On the Daniel Larson wiki, Michael has an entire article dedicated to him where he's accused of being a substance abuser who's addicted to either benzos or coke. Claims like these are mostly based on a number of, let's just say, very memorable appearances. On multiple occasions, he would go on TikTok Live and look absolutely off his rocker. One of these, helpfully enshrined on Reddit, sees Michael talking to someone of very vaguely Mediterranean descent. While we don't know the full context of this clip, what it shows is very telling as Michael lays into them with some very harsh words, including the repeated use use of the n-word with the hard r, all while looking completely stoned or hammered out of his mind. Wait, is Michael Quinn actually base? This video, as well as others, quickly led to even more backlash, and it made the Reddit detectives go into overdrive, trying to figure out what kind of drugs he's on. One commenter noted it's most likely benzos mixed with alcohol. I'm not a medical expert, try to take these comments with a pinch of salt, this is Reddit after all, but it's possible, I guess. Regardless of the veracity of these claims, what matters here is that the backlash against Michael simply kept growing, and as time went on, more and more things about him would come to the limelight. People found all kinds of interesting factoids when they began to dig into his personal history, where they found that he actually used to be a substitute teacher. Michael Quinn getting bullied as substitute teacher. Okay, this is not gonna go on anymore. Enough. 
Eventually, this backlash entered the YouTube sphere, where it extended from just mocking Michael, and actually was redirected to even further attention getting on Josh. A number of videos came out discussing Josh's obvious drinking problem, mostly by small YouTubers, as there was never exactly a mainstream drive behind any of these. Still, you had small creators like Zade Gets Laid making comprehensive critiques of the guy, sharing Joshua's rapid descent into degeneracy. This is where CD re-enters the picture. He would initially post a video on his TikTok channel, where he criticized Michael for enabling Joshua's alcohol habit, making the point that he he clearly had the resources to genuinely help him, but that he simply didn't care to do so. I've been reluctant to make this video, but I'm going to. I was on this guy Michael Quinn's live stream last night when he was drinking with World of T-Shirts on a Monday. I have to say, I do take an issue with you paying for World of T-Shirts' drinks when he's obviously a struggling alcoholic. This guy says he wants to help Josh, yet publicly contributes to his downward spiral into alcoholism. Okay, so you pay for his phone bill. Great, do you want a cookie? The fact is, you've probably done irreversible damage to Joshua's life. You have the ability and resources to probably get Josh some help, but I do not think you care or want to. I firmly believe that if Josh had friends his own age that were good influences on him, that he would be all right. While it was a fairly harmless video compared to the other accusations, it seems this one got a lot more attention, as Michael himself took notice of it. In a now-deleted TikTok, he said CD was dead to Joshua, hinting at their former friendship. At the same time, another large TikToker called Ryan the Lion, who also happens to be within Michael's cadre of friends would reply to it, effectively dismissing the accusations. This, along with some other comments, led CD to release a much more in-depth video on his YouTube channel. In this scathing critique, he admits that he wasn't really acquainted with Josh at this point. Still, he goes on to defend him, arguing that his alcoholism is entirely Michael's fault. He also highlights some statements made by him, where he defends what he does by saying it's all for the good of the creators he works with. He accused him of being the reason Josh had stopped talking to CD in the first place, claiming Michael to be a manipulator who was separating Josh from all of his friends to keep his control. The big thing I have a problem with is a sign of a manipulator is separating someone from their friends, their good influences, whatever. That is what Michael Quinn is doing. He is making sure that Josh now no longer has any contact with me. He's making sure that Josh is separated from anybody that could potentially take him away from you, Michael. And that is a sign of a manipulator slash abuser. CD goes on to show a clip of Michael saying something very, very inappropriate read about Daniel Larson, basically threatening physical violence against the man for some reason. This really is the f***ing Spurg Avengers coming together to just go to war with each other, and this particular drama would eventually develop into something bigger, but for now, we'll keep it at that. While there admittedly isn't much new information in the CD video, it's at least worth noting that CD does genuinely seem to care about Joshua, which most other people frankly don't. At the very least, it seems they had been really good friends prior to Michael breaking them up. As far as I can tell, Michael never replied to this officially, apart from a few snide comments made at CD. CD's expense. Likely, he didn't really want to bring more attention to it, given CD was probably right. Of course, this didn't stop people from continuing to hurl some very fair criticism his way, which only led to him responding more and more negatively. In the end, for all the criticism, Michael never really stopped hanging out with Josh. To this day, he continues to walk around New York with him and even travel the world with him, and all expenses paid trips to Italy, Iceland, and anywhere else you can think of. While he constantly catches more and more negative attention, it doesn't seem he's that phased by it. Not least of all because he doesn't actually rely on TikTok as a means of getting an income, given his own pre-existing hot dog wealth. As Joshua's manager, Michael would, of course, try to contribute to the management side of things, which he did by diversifying his income streams. Of these, one suggestion would really take root. World of T-Shirts New York Tour. A brainchild of Michael and Josh's collective brain power, it would see the duo do basically the same thing they always do, while also having multiple people tag along with them, pretending to act as tour guides. On a website called Holy Prof Web, it's described as a unique and immersive experience. Exactly five times. The whole article seems written by AI, fluffing up the whole tour as much as possible while also padding out the word count. But other than this obvious shill review, it also has a whole website dedicated to it, as well as its own section on the World of T-Shirts primary website. The dedicated website itself looks less professional than any WordPress or anything site I've ever seen. In fact, being kind of a shitty website, it doesn't actually say that it's being run by Joshua either, instead being portrayed as a tour inspired by World of T-Shirts, whatever that is supposed to mean. It captures the essence of World of T-Shirts t-shirts, the flavor profile. However, despite Josh's no doubt staggering star power, the tour was received pretty poorly. Clips would begin to pop up of people filming themselves for taking in the activity, and pretty much all of them were done in mockery of Josh and Michael. There's nothing you can't do. Now you're in New York. We ended up in Times Square. 
He danced, ran upstairs ten times, and left. Perhaps even more amusing than these clips, however, are the Google Maps reviews of the service. Boasting a grand score of 1.7 stars, he hasn't exactly been showered by praise, and one glance at the reviews should give you an idea why. The first review that pops up claims that Josh had showed up to the starting spot of the tour already completely hammered, and even having pissed his pants prior to showing up, only to call the review's author an unemployed piece of shit when asked if he would get him a complimentary drink. Another review posted by an actual tour guide was equally as scornful, giving a similar recollection of events as the first first one, with the addition that he actually threatened to sue some of the people there for no discernible reason. You get pretty much the same story scrolling through the rest of the reviews, with just about every positive review being some sort of troll, or otherwise just not taking it very seriously. Indeed, the tour became so infamous for its shoddiness that it ended up catching some attention on YouTube and TikTok, with creators like Lolcow Designs even going through the reviews for content. Oddly, if you look for reviews of it via the Google search engine, you'll probably find this little article on a website called Passion Fruit. This review gives us a very different view of Josh. Josh, although perhaps not a very different view of the tour itself. He describes, in short, the process of booking a tour, which involved receiving a waiver via Google Docs, which warned the world of t-shirts would not be liable if the author were to be bitten by rats during the tour. Not sure why that's so specifically listed. I've personally toured New York, and I've never had any liability waiver list anything about being bitten by rats, but you never know what's going to happen with Josh. They would then set up a meeting, which Josh would show up to half an hour late for, at which point they had a very curt interview, which, as the author writes, had nothing he could actually use in his article. He then describes the tour, which involved them walking across the streets aimlessly, while the author asked Joshua questions about his life, as well as just tried to really talk to him normally one-on-one. -on -one. Josh would constantly give people side glances, paranoid that any single one of them could be a troll, and he rejected everyone who approached him for a photo. He justifies some of this paranoia with a story he tells the author from when he was in Texas. One day, when he came back to his hotel room, he saw that someone had broken in and defecated on his bed. At one point, Josh would pull out his phone, and as is usual for these tours, he would film a TikTok. After that, they took a metro ride on the train to Williamsburg, until they reached a bar by the name of Union Pool, where everyone was too old to recognize Josh. Then, they walked over to another bar, where the author alleges he bought Joshua a margarita as a thank you, at which point they said their goodbyes, and the autist in chief slunk away into the shadows. The article provides an interesting view of Josh, describing him as a very earnest and kind person, highlighting just how much he differs from the idea promulgated by social media. From clips of him behaving like a total nitwit, to the thousands of hate videos made about him. Largely, the author seems satisfied, albeit he never spoke to the tour's quality. Overall, this was the most positive reception the tour ever got, and it's only positive because it entirely ignores the fact that there was even a, you know, tour in the first place. Despite this, the project is still ongoing, with most of the tours getting a dedicated TikTok in lieu of Joshua's ceaseless hustling, all while being constantly babysat by a man twice his age, who is not his father or relative in any way. Speaking of Michael, as I've alluded to earlier, he would get Josh into a rather strange bit of beef with Daniel Larson, another channel favorite here. While it's hard to say exactly where it started, it seems that fans of the two respective creators were really pushing them to have a fight with each other in New York City. This led to the two of them to name drop each other, with Michael even supposedly trying to set up a boxing match. A lot of this drama is pretty much entirely contained to Michael's account, which has since been nuked. This complicates the process of tracking down how exactly it developed. What we do know is that at some point, Michael claimed that Daniel Larson had found his home address, even though there didn't seem to be much proof. This led to him releasing a video talking about how he would have to hire bodyguards for Josh to protect him from Daniel Larson. All right, so get this. I'm hiring a security detail even larger than the one that Donald Trump has to defend World of T-shirts from Daniel Larson. Conversely, Daniel would respond to what he deemed as threats from Michael by making a legal threat. This message is for Michael Quinn. If you do not stop with the threats, then I will be forced to press charges and file a seize and desist. This all came to a head with Michael trying to set up a meeting between Josh and Daniel, where the latter would have to travel to New York City all the way from California. So after two hours of negotiations, we came to an agreement that Josh wants to meet Daniel Larson. It's going to happen. Plus yes. the stipulations. A couple of stipulations. Yeah. You know, first of all, I have to be there. It has to be a place yes. they won't be doxxed. Yes. And we want to make sure that Netflix covers it. Apparently, this little deal was preceded by Michael and Daniel meeting randomly on the street while they were both out, and they ended up chatting each other up before Daniel started to live stream with Mike. I'm going to get the Nobel Peace Prize because I'm going to introduce him to World of T-Shirts. 
and the whole world is going to be beautiful. The impression gathered by most was that Michael was basically trying to stir trouble between the two for no other reason than to farm clout. This is certainly a prevailing belief on the world of t-shirts subreddit where, as we've already discussed, people hate Michael's guts. Not that I really blame them. Nonetheless, this wouldn't stop the meeting from actually happening and later in May, Daniel flew out to New York where he finally met the dastardly duo in real life. Their whole meeting would be streamed on Michael's TikTok, which thankfully was archived. For the entirety of the meeting, they're sitting in a diner eating food while Michael and Joshua recorded at the same time. For the most part, Daniel Larson and Joshua Block don't really seem that interested in actually talking to each other, seemingly only doing so out of politeness. It's pretty awkward to listen to. Meanwhile, Michael's the one largely driving the conversation, trying to get them to interact in a more entertaining manner, like when he randomly asked what kind of collabs they would do. In particular, Michael actually invited Daniel to Joshua's signature tour of New York. Can you guys do like daily collaborations maybe in the city? Would you like that, Josh? Yes. Yep. Wouldn't that be that. awesome? You guys. I have a tour on Friday night. Yeah. Why don't you? Would you let him join for free the tour? Uh, I can't do that. It's not fair. Like... All right. You want me to pay for his tour if he shows up? I'll okay. pay for your tour. The topic eventually shifts to Reddit, and especially about how terrible it is for spreading fake news about all three of them. Michael seems particularly livid throughout this discussion, making his opinion crystal clear. I don't go on Reddit. I hate Reddit. All they do is make fun of me. Well, they are a news source, and that's what the news is. But they're does. fake news. They're, fa they're, they're terrible. They're fake news. Everybody it's worse than TMZ, yeah. After this, Josh starts talking about how someone had created a Yelp account under his name, which resulted in him getting flooded with negative reviews, which, in his view, are entirely misplaced, given that he's never actually received a complaint from any of his fans for his services. He does not bring up the Google reviews, if you were wondering, but honestly, I would doubt that he even knows they exist. After a short discussion about how both Josh and Daniel were regularly getting swatted, Michael, once again showing he's puppet mastering this thing, forces in Joshua's signature catchphrase. Josh, do me a favor. Ask Daniel if he's ever been on Tinder. Have you been on Tinder? Yes. Mine got said B-A-N-E-D. What does that mean? What does that mean? B-A-N-E-D. Well, He's banned from Tinder. Right, okay. I've largely avoided mentioning it as it's frankly kind of cringe, but after the original Side Dog interview, where the banned from the Gucci store meme had been born, Josh would try to relight that flame by morphing the meme into something different. As we already know, he took the word banned and made it part of his whole advertising persona. Subsequently, he would turn it into a catchphrase, in which he changed the Gucci store to Tinder. Well, I go to open Tinder. What does B-A-N-N-E-D mean? Banned. Banned? I don't have insurance. But back to the interview, the discussion loops back to swatting and doxing. In particular, Josh brings up how, due to people doxing a lot of the bars he goes to, a lot of bartenders would outright refuse to serve him. Knowing Joshua, he probably sees this as the absolute worst thing that could happen to him. The most interesting part of this whole clip is a rather brief part during which Michael asks Joshua if he's going to stop drinking, clearly doing so to solicit a viewworthy reaction. Joshua responds to this in a rather interesting manner, accepting that he does indeed have a drinking problem, but says he's unwilling to commit to stopping. You're going to quit drinking, right? No. No? I'll, I'll moderate my drinking. What about quit altogether? What, what, you think you should, maybe. What I, do you think, Dan? You think you should quit drinking? No. No, I don't think I should quit. I should cut down, though. You, you should cut down. Cut, cut down, down, yes. Because yeah. you drink, too. So, you know, I don't end up in the hospital once a week, you know? Yeah, I don't, I've only been in the hospital <laughs> twice. I think once is more than enough, you know? I he also reveals that his drinking problem has led him to end up in the hospital twice. Of course, he doesn't say it with a level of severity that that kind of statement should warrant, but he does say it. After that, there's not much to say about the interview. Michael does his best to keep the chat going as long as possible, and to the credit of our two two TikTok e-celebrities, they are decent at engaging in casual conversation with each other by the end. Josh seems excited for an upcoming trip to Vegas, with perhaps the most interesting part being the fact he's mildly worried about his safety, as he's unwilling to leave the touristy areas. He seems to have a fear of the rascals of Las Vegas. In the end, Daniel and Josh part ways, having officially made peace, which is then further discussed between Josh and Mike. It's strange to hear Michael talk about it as though it had been some earth-shattering drama, considering it was completely astroturfed by him and then ended by him. There isn't really much of a takeaway here, nor a whole lot resulting from it. The much-hyped collabs they talked about never really materialized, and in the eyes of most, the meeting was pretty underwhelming, not helped by the fact that most of it was just being steered by Michael. The most entertaining thing people got out of it was this brief animated clip, which parodied the whole interaction. What does B-A-N-N-E-D mean? 
Strangely though, despite this beef seemingly being over, this didn't exactly put an end to the back and forth. While Josh was absent from it from this point on, Michael and Daniel continued to make comments about each other, although 90% of it was coming from Michael, with Daniel just occasionally firing back. Admittedly, this got pretty weird. About two months after the interview, Daniel Larson made a very odd series of tweets where he made the claim that he just had intimate relations with Michael Quinn. I don't know if that's true. Considering it's Daniel Larson, I'd say that it's 100% certified true by true based American patriots. Uh, it's probably not true, yeah. There isn't much more to say about Michael after this, at least nothing relevant to us. His main account got deleted, and his presumed second account also got deleted. Since then, he tried to reestablish himself, with a TikTok I showed being his latest attempt. As for Josh, things would only continue to get worse and more complicated for him. His behavior would become more and more erratic, not to mention more and more controversial. While he'd largely avoided the attention of YouTubers before, a lot of people, largely smaller creators, would start making videos about him, as clips of his outbursts were circulating again and again. Among these clips, one of them that really made its way around was from a live stream of Josh from sometime in early 2023. The stream started innocently enough until the King of New York is approached by someone claiming to be a fan, only to really quickly devolve into whatever this is. My name is Yuzma, and I've been hired by somebody on TikTok to supervise all autistic people. And, uh, no. looks like you're oh, yes. I'm gonna do your bodyguard slash caretaker. No, you won't. Hey, get back here. Stop the stage. Stay broken back here. It turns out this man is Douglas Skates, who from what I can gather, is a bit of a professional troll, having approached Josh mainly for clout. As you can see, Josh isn't exactly enthused to talk to him, which leads to a very strange back and forth wherein Josh tries to leave the man as far behind as possible, only for Douglas to always catch up to him, to which Josh always seems pretty shocked. I, I don't want to talk to you. I'm here to help. No. If you, if I'm calling the police. This would keep happening pretty much for the entirety of the live stream, with Douglas constantly popping out of nowhere, just spawning in place, always able to find Josh within a few minutes of losing him. This should, of course, not really be surprising given Josh continued to stream his location, meaning Douglas could easily just watch it, find out where he is again, and then wait for him to leave, and then find him again. This clip ended up circulating both on TikTok and YouTube, mainly due to Josh's very, very angry disposition towards Douglas. Doug himself would release clips of his interactions as part of a larger video, where, as the title suggests, he's trying to get banned from every library in town. Chill out, bro. We're cool. Oh, oh, wait, don't We're cool. Guys, I'm sorry. I'm taking care of him. He's getting mad. I I'm his caretaker. Calm no, down. You're not. Don't hit me, sir. Look, bro. As more and more of his public outbursts were exposed via compilations and re-uploads, Josh would start catching the attention of the commentary scene, resulting in a number of videos being released about him, namely from Kiwi Tapes. But more interesting than most of these videos is a release from a channel called Masshole Media. The channel released a video in the form of a documentary, where the filming crew shows us a day in the life of Joshua Block. It does give us a pretty interesting look at the kind of person Josh is, being fairly polite with the filming crew throughout. We get to see what he looks and acts like when he's not the one holding the camera, and frankly, he seems like a pretty nice dude when he's not plastered out of his mind. How come, excuse me, is it true that like, I heard, I looked on Google and bartenders can't accept an anti-state ID in mass, is that No, true? that's not true, no. that's not true. How come I saw that on Google? But is it like a law that they can't accept it, but they don't no. enforce it? We also get to see some more candid interactions with fans, who end up approaching him in droves. This time around, he does accept photo opportunities and doesn't actually ask for money from anyone. In general, the documentary puts quite a positive spin on Josh and his behavior, which frankly was a pretty refreshing find, but it doesn't exactly break new grounds by giving us more lore, other than making one very interesting assertion regarding Josh's drinking habit. The alcohol situation with Josh, from what I saw and who I spoke with, he has about four to five drinks a day. We went to two bars and he just got out of dinner when I saw him. So he probably had three drinks when I, like, around the time when I was around. It wasn't like going to one bar, having five drinks, then leaving, going to the next bar, having five drinks, then leaving. It was one drink, you'd sit in there, he'd sip on it, he'd do whatever. He'd walk around for another hour, 30 minutes, whatever, and then we'd go to another bar and he'd have another drink. That's kind of what I perceived it as. Um, obviously, people are going to have other stories and kind of explain what they've seen from him, whether it be on his tours and whatever, but he was controlling it and he was doing like a very very good job and he was still coherent i didn't notice anything out of the blue suffice to say the mass hole channel has a rather flowery view of josh's alcoholism although admittedly finding out how bad his drinking is is kind of hard given the statements by his customers we know it's pretty bad but without concrete numbers it's hard to tell if he's like you know pretty degenerate alcoholic or on the verge of death but as luck would have it we wouldn't be without concrete data for long as the same month of the doc's release a channel will be created on tiktok with a clear purpose to answer the question of just how bad 
bad Josh's alcoholism is. The channel is pretty amusingly called World of Alcohol Tracker, and it boasts 170,000 followers of its own, pretty much spending its entire time keeping up on Josh's day-to-day -day activities, with a big focus on keeping track of how much he drinks. This is best exemplified by his very first video, where he notes down every single drink Josh had consumed on camera, calculating that, accounting for loss of blood alcohol level due to sobering up in between drinks, he would have had around 0.21% blood alcohol content level by 8 p.m., having started drinking around noon. For context, if you blow a 0.8 when you get pulled over, you're probably going to get a DUI. So Josh is at triple that amount. With a slight break following the second video, this guy went on to diligently catalog Joshua's alcohol consumption for every single day from the 31st of October all the way up to January. He even documented a few more relevant metrics, including the amount of money Josh would spend on drinks and even the amount of calories consumed. The channel got a shocking amount of attention, especially considering that it really hasn't been around that long and is like a niche account following a relatively niche person in the grand scheme of things, just covering his alcohol addiction. It's such a small area of anything to focus on and it blew up, which if anything shows just how fascinated people are with the world of t-shirts. Less than two weeks after posting his first video, he posted another breakdown, which ended up netting him over 2 million views. And in that video, he concluded that throughout the 8th of November, 2023, Josh got to a blood alcohol level of around 0.22, paid roughly $25 and consumed around 2,300 calories. For those who don't know, 2,300 calories is around what an average male his age would eat in a day. And he was consuming that in alcohol alone. The whole channel serves as a stark reminder of just how bad Josh's addiction has gotten. And given that he hits at least 0.2 across pretty much all these videos, it's clear that this man is drinking himself into an early grave. This new perspective on Josh led to a lot of attention being brought back to the world of t-shirts channel, which was largely negative. While most had always been vaguely aware of his problem, these videos opened a lot of people's eyes to just how bad the problem was. Conversely, Josh and Michael would both end up learning about the tracker. According to the tracker himself, Michael came out against him, arguing he was sending people to Josh who would actively encourage him to drink more. Tracker dismissed that idea wholesale, arguing the only people encouraging it are people from Michael's side of things, which is definitely true. I'm not here to physically help Josh anymore. I'm just here to leverage his account and his content to help people. I've gotten hundreds of messages validating that people are drinking less because of this content, are more mindful about their drinking, and I think this is all great positive reinforcement that this content is helping people. So I, I'm so happy for that, and happy for all of you guys. And as MQ says in this clip, my viewers or community are the ones telling Josh, oh, you need to get to 16, you need to break a new personal record. Those people are from his own community, and they have been the ones from day one of his drinking you know, career on TikTok. They're the ones egging him on. Regardless of what Michael Quinn might want us to believe, everyone knew that Josh had a problem, regardless of the tracker's presence. Things are really put into perspective when we reach the end of 2023, with an update for December 31st. In it, he gives a breakdown for the whole day. But the really interesting part comes later, when he looks back over the entire month of December. According to his study, we find out Josh has spent around $1,500 on alcohol, with an average blood alcohol level at around 0.08, which, once again, is when you get a DUI. He would only spend 34% of the month sober, being at least slightly drunk 64% of the time, above driving limit for 40% of the time, and blackout drunk about 9% of the time. From this, he would also draw an average for the entire year, asserting that throughout 2023, Josh would have spent around $18,000 on alcohol and consumed 570 5,000 calories from drinking alone. Frankly though, while the tracker undoubtedly did really good work, it's really hard to see this having much of an effect. The truth is that Josh is showing no signs of changing at all. And pretty much for the whole last year, he's been stuck in Groundhog Day, doing the same thing over and over again to an audience of people who, for the most part, couldn't really care less what happens to him. This is best exemplified when you look at his channel today. While he still gets respectable views, compounded by the fact that he releases up to a dozen videos in a single day, the comment sections are universally filled with either trolls who want him to drink more, or people referencing the tracker who, while not being fans of him, do care enough to at least say that he should stop drinking. We live in a time when pretty much anyone can get famous for anything, and there's no better example of this than TikTok. The number of absolute degenerates who gain popularity just for that is uncountable. Given that, it shouldn't be a surprise that Joshua Block has found so much success. For all of his faults, one can't deny his achievements. He managed to turn his status as a lol cow into a little career, and to this day he makes enough money to fund his very expensive drinking habit. But that's simultaneously the tragedy tragedy of it. He's always encouraged to continue the self-destructive behavior with no regard for how it affects his mental and physical health because it keeps getting views. In that, it's hard to feel anything but pity for this guy. Despite his flawed personality, the truth is that he's not nearly as bad as many other people on the platform, and frankly, he is literally autistic. Like, this guy kind of needs help, and it's not from Michael Quinn. To see him self-destruct in such a spectacular fashion is pretty heartbreaking. I can't predict what will happen to the guy, but personally, I do hope he gets better at some point, and the first step to that is probably him getting off of TikTok. As
as for if that's going to happen, I wouldn't speak confidently either way. I've been Turkey Tom. Thanks for watching. And until next time, leave me alone.